Welcome, dear viewers, to a journey through the darkest corners of history, where secrets are buried and shadows conceal unsolved mysteries. On this channel, we embark on a chilling exploration of historical crimes and murder that have sent shivers down the spines of generations. From infamous killers to unsolved mysteries that continue to baffle experts, our quest for the truth will take us on a harrowing ride through time. These stories are not for the faint of heart. Join me as we unravel the chilling tales of deception, betrayal, and bloodshed that have left an indelible mark on history. Brace yourselves, for the past is riddled with secrets that are waiting to be unearthed. So, grab your detective hats because this is Crimes and Murder, unveiling history's darkest secrets. This true murder crime story starts as most stories do, not at the very beginning, but when we first become aware that a body has been discovered. We will follow the investigation as the police methodically pursue the evidence. The location is the quiet old-fashioned town of Arundel, on the south coast of England near the beautiful South Downs. In the late afternoon of the 10th of August 1948, local man Thomas Spillman, 26 years old, arrived at the local police station. He had ridden there in some panic on a bicycle. He jumped off his bike by now sweating after his exertion in the summer heat dropped the bike where he was, and entered the door. Breathless after his cycle ride, he tried to compose himself enough to tell the desk sergeant he had found a woman's body in a box copse in Arundel Park. The sergeant immediately dispatched two constables to where Spillman had said he'd found the body. Exactly as described, the woman's body was laying on a wooded slope in the box copse. The body had been there for some considerable time, as both constables felt quite sick as the head and shoulders of the body were in a high form of decomposition. The body itself was in a far less decomposed state. They could see she was only partially clothed, wearing pink cami knickers, a bra and elastic suspender belt, stockings and sandals. Round her neck was a string of pearls and a ring on the right hand. Higher up the slope, ten metres or so from the body, they discovered a Macintosh was spread out on the grass, and a beige overcoat had been rolled up at one end like a pillow. Nearby, her clothes were neatly folded, and they discovered a brown leather handbag. They then sealed the scene and reported to the sergeant, who then called for an expert CID investigation. Local detectives, while waiting for the Home Office pathologist to investigate, had a look through her handbag. In the handbag were a powder compact, left luggage ticket from Worthing Station, a pair of sunglasses, a green and gold lipstick case, and an envelope containing a single luminol sleeping tablet. At her side, beside the body, was an empty bottle of lemon barley water. They also discovered a diary and paperwork proving who this young lady was. Her name was Joan Woodhouse, and she lived in London in a young woman's Christian Association hostel in Blackheath, South East London. She worked at the National Central Library in Mallet Street in Kingsbury, London. Once the detectives began to investigate, now knowing her name, they soon discovered that she had been reported missing on Tuesday the 3rd of August. Chief Inspector Fred Narborough had been dispatched from Scotland Yard to assist the West Sussex CID. The following day, on August 11th, Dr Keith Simpson, the Home Office pathologist, arrived at the scene. He was unable to give a precise date for the death. The recent changeable weather, a mixture of rain and intermittent hot sunshine, had accelerated the decomposition of the body. Simpson's best estimate was that she had died between eight and ten days previously. However, in her handbag, there was a newspaper neatly folded dated the 31st of July 1948, and this strongly favoured that date as the day she died. Simpson's early examination told him that she had been strangled. He found fingertip-type bruises to the muscles of both sides of the neck and the right horn of the hyoid bone. There was also some minor bruising on the scalp, over the spine and hip. On the side and around the entrance to the vagina, there was further bruising, hinting at a violent penetration. There was also a pubic hair on her bra. The body by now was infested with maggots, which had removed all signs of any semen. The body was now removed for a complete autopsy. After this, Keith Simpsons viewed this as a sex murder, and this was also the conclusion of Detective Chief Inspector Fred Narborough. Any theory that it might have been a robbery was soon dismissed. The pearls around her neck were intact, the handbag containing pound notes untouched. From the beginning, the police wondered if she had been accompanied by a man-friend. Had there been some preliminary sexual activity, which unexpectedly turned sour? Or had she simply been laying down to sunbathe and been chanced upon by the total stranger? 
There were some indications that despite her small frame, she had put up a brief struggle and managed to escape just a few yards down a little pathway, tearing her stockings and scratching her legs as she ran. Perhaps she had been murdered on the Macintosh and then carried to a less conspicuous place. There was nothing in the way of fingerprints on the bottle as they had been washed away in the previous week's rain. So the investigation now turned to understanding why this young lady was in Arundel Park when she lived in London. On interviewing Joan's friends, the police discovered on the Saturday morning of the bank holiday weekend, the 31st of July, she had told them that she was returning home to Barnsley to see her father. It was a good opportunity, as it was bank holiday. She did not need to be back at work until the Tuesday. Her friend Nicole Ashby has said she waved goodbye to her as she travelled to the underground and wished her a happy weekend. She saw Joan entering the underground station, and that was the last time she saw her. Now the police began their hunt by speaking to railway staff at the London stations and to bus drivers and taxi drivers to discover where Joan went. It seems instead of going to King's Cross Station, which would carry her north to her home and father, she instead went to Victoria Station. She bought a single ticket to Worthing on the south coast. The booking clerk confirmed she was alone and bought only one ticket. The police managed to speak with several witnesses who had been on the train that remembered seeing Joan. Some said she was travelling alone, and some said she was accompanied by a man. Every description of the male were vastly different, throwing some doubt that she was with a companion. When Joan arrived at Worthing Station, she went to the left luggage office and left her small case and severed the tab, which she placed in her handbag. The police made extensive inquiries, but could find no more witness sightings of her in Worthing. Next, she appears in Arundel. It must be assumed she got there by bus, but no bus drivers remember her. Of course, it is a bank holiday weekend, it is very hot, perfect weather for holiday makers, and so Arundel is very crowded. Although Joan is not spotted specifically, we know she went to a chemist on the high street and bought a bottle of lemon barley. The chemist did not recognise a picture of Joan, but he did remember selling the bottle. Another witness, a Miss Dilby, recalls seeing a young woman alone, answering Joan's description, walking towards Arundel Park. There were several other sightings of Joan alone this hot afternoon, which the police considered to be Joan. In police investigation, the next line of questioning followed any potential sightings of Joan Woodhouse in the company of a man. This inquiry was public and, of course, yielded a mass of responses. Some individuals claimed to have indeed seen her in the company of a gentleman, while others adamantly swore that they had observed her alone. Further scrutiny was directed towards a particular party that Joan had attended in North London on the 13th of July. A focal point of curiosity revolved around a certain gentleman who had caught Joan's attention, a man she had evidently mentioned to her friends. Yet, as the investigation unfolded, it became increasingly evident that this man was merely a red herring, a distraction from the core truth. Meanwhile, assertions arose from some hoteliers in Worthing, who believed that Joan and a male companion had lodged at their establishments during the bank holiday weekend. The landlord of the George and Dragon in Burfham, located roughly three miles from Arundel, reported an encounter with a young woman bearing a resemblance to Joan. According to the landlord, she had stopped by for a drink at approximately 12.30 in the afternoon on a Saturday. She was accompanied by a man, described as being around 30 years old with a medium build and stature. However, even accounting for potential discrepancies in the timeline, it became glaringly evident that this could not have been Joan. At the approximate time of the reported encounter, Joan Woodhouse had been depositing her luggage at Worthing Station, a fact that firmly established her whereabouts and ruled out any possibility of her presence at the George and Dragon. As with most sightings of Joan with a man, they appeared doubtful. Now, as the true manhunt took place extended to hotels and boarding houses, reception staff, cleaners' room maids, every British Railways employee at Victoria, Worthing and Arundel, taxi drivers, van drivers, bus drivers and conductors, secretaries in the neighbouring towns and villages. It was claimed at the time the aim was to interview every male over the age of 15 in Worthing and Arundel, but we have no way of knowing if this was ever achieved. It was obviously a, was a massive operation, searching for an unknown man who had been in the area between 10 and 8 days before the body was found. Naturally, we are left with Joan's diary, which contained the names of approximately 150 individuals, the majority of whom were men she had encountered in the past six months. Curiously, 
There were no diary entries during the two weeks leading up to her tragic demise. One might wonder about the nature of a young woman who meticulously catalogued men's names in this fashion. Could there be a concealed history? Did the unassuming librarian harbour a hidden life? Narborough and his investigative team embarked on a mission to interview all of Joan's friends and acquaintances, as well as to track down any strangers who might have crossed paths with her over the holiday weekend. Narborough had a hunch that lurking in the background was an unidentified lover, with whom Joan had engaged in a clandestine relationship. Perhaps she had met this mysterious person in Worthing or Arundel, and together they had ventured to box cops. A dedicated team of 100 detectives painstakingly scrutinised every name listed in the diary. Narborough remained convinced that the murderer lurked among these names, but alas, they only led to numerous other dead ends. As it turned out, the men mentioned in the diary primarily consisted of fellow librarians from Britain, who were members of a professional association for which Joan served as the honorary secretary. The remaining names were simply friends and relatives. After all the man-hours and effort, by the middle of September, the investigation had achieved nothing to help find Joan's murderer. The ongoing investigation had, in fact, unveiled significant insights into Joan's character and background. It, in fact, demonstrated that some of the national press commentary had been egregiously unfair in prematurely passing judgment on her, simply because she was a partially unclothed woman with a list of men's names in her diary. Contrary to the hasty assumptions, Joan was a very respectable young lady, known for her role as a Sunday school teacher and her profound devotion to her faith. Just a few months prior, she and her boyfriend had earnestly discussed the prospect of marriage. However, their relationship had encountered insurmountable hurdles stemming from their differing religious beliefs. Joan couldn't bring herself to commit to a man whose convictions didn't align closely with her own deeply held faith. The breakup of their relationship had caused Joan considerable emotional distress, which ultimately led her to make a regrettable, albeit unsuccessful, attempt at taking her own life. An inquest convened on the 13th of August, merely three days following the discovery of the body. However, it was subsequently adjourned to grant the police ample time to apprehend the perpetrator. After an arduous six-week search that yielded no results, doubt began to creep into Chief Inspector Narborough's mind. Perhaps, he pondered, he had been pursuing a misguided lead. It was during this period of the manhunt that Joan's aunt made a casual comment that sparked a new line of thinking. She casually remarked how much Joan enjoyed sunbathing and suggested that it wouldn't be surprising for her to have sought out a secluded spot to bask in the sun's warmth. This comment shifted Narborough's perspective entirely. Could it be possible that Joan had simply looked for a spot to sunbath? Had she secluded herself from the world, seeking solitude and freedom from disruptions, only to encounter an unforeseen individual? It was during these moments what Narborough later referred to as the six wasted weeks that he began to entertain these unsettling notions. Had a local resident surreptitiously trailed her, or was it a complete stranger who happened upon Joan? Did this encounter culminate in a horrific sequence of events? involving assault and strangulation. When the inquest resumed on November 22nd, it became evident that Narbra had identified a potential suspect, but lacked sufficient evidence to press charges. The individual in question was Thomas Spillman, a 24-year-old residing in Offham near Arundel. Spillman resided with his parents in a grace and favour residence on the Duke of Norfolk's estate, and his occupation involved working as a house painter for a local builder. During the adjourned inquest on August 13th, Spillman had testified to discovering the body. He provided a detailed account of his actions on that particular day. He explained that, despite suffering from a poisoned hand, he had been absent from work. Around two o'clock in the afternoon, he left home and made his way to his allotment in Burfham, where he spent some time. Later, he embarked on his journey back home, opting for a shortcut through the park. It was during this shortcut through box cops that he stumbled upon the lifeless body. Reacting promptly, Spillman said he rushed down to the lodge, borrowed a bicycle, and pedalled swiftly to the nearest police station to report his unsettling discovery. Now, let's take a look back at the renewed inquest, where all eyes were on Spillman. The coroner kindly informed him that he wasn't obligated to answer any questions that might incriminate him. Such advice might seem a bit unusual today, and it probably raised some eyebrows among the jurors even then. After all, this was just an inquest a simple quest to figure out how Joan Woodhouse had died. 
Spillman hadn't been charged with anything, and yet here he was, being reminded of his legal rights. In fact, he even brought his solicitor along to court. The jury is curious, the foreman asked. Is it usual for a witness to have legal representation when they're just talking about finding the body? The coroner's response was that the jury should decide for themselves if that seemed normal. The fact was, by that stage of the investigation, Narborough had decided that Spillman was guilty, but simply didn't have enough evidence to charge him. So, all the questioning at the coroner's inquest was based on this belief. The reason the chief inspector had come to this decision was because, over the course of police interviews about how Spillman had found the body, he did in fact change his story on three occasions. Originally, as you know, he stated that he used the park as a shortcut, but the police soon proved that it was not a shortcut. In his second statement, he had corrected this. He said that he had gone into the copse as he was poaching rabbits. He hadn't said before because it might have been revealed to the headkeeper, and it could mean trouble and even end up with his parents being evicted from their grace and favour cottage. So finally, he said he had seen two younger girls going into the wooded area and intended to expose himself to them. He had a conviction for indecent exposure. When he went into the copse, he didn't see the girls, but that's when he found the body. During the hearing, Spillman was cross-examined by counsel for the police, and his story was vague, and he agreed he had changed his statement three times, and also had been confused whether he had been in the park on the 31st of July. However, he claimed this was due to the pressure put upon him during interviews with Narborough, which confused him. When all the evidence had been presented, the coroner told the jury, as there was no hard evidence to bring about a charge, they must deliver a verdict that Joan Woodhouse had been murdered by some person, or persons unknown. This they duly did. Joan's family was left in profound anguish by the outcome of the inquest. After discussing the matter with Detective Chief Inspector Narborough, who firmly believed that Thomas Spillman was the perpetrator of the murder, the two aunts, Mrs. Sheriff and Mrs. Blades, were resolute in their determination to bring the case to a resolution and see the guilty party brought to trial. However, Detective Chief Inspector Narborough couldn't uncover any additional evidence and was no longer able to allocate time or detectives to the case. Consequently, they decided to seek assistance elsewhere. To begin their pursuit of justice, they offered a reward of £500 in exchange for valuable information, yet this yielded no fruitful leads. Then, in August 1949, 14 months after the tragic murder had occurred, they enlisted the services of a retired CID sergeant by the name of Tom Jack. Jack's experience in handling murder cases was somewhat limited, as his primary focus had been on divorce cases within his private detective agency. Nonetheless, the aunts placed their unwavering trust in him, and Jack certainly committed himself wholeheartedly to the task at hand. Over the course of the ensuing twelve months, he dedicated his time and effort to the investigation, working tirelessly. At a rate of two guineas a day, equivalent to approximately two hundred pounds in today's currency, the aunts expended a substantial portion of their savings to fund his endeavours. Throughout his investigative journey, of which fifty-five days were spent in Arundel, Jack interviewed a staggering total of over two hundred individuals. Jack's relentless efforts stirred significant interest from the media regarding the case. A Sunday Mirror article penned by Spillman voiced concerns about how the local community seemed to regard him as a murder suspect, lamenting the toll it was taking on his life and that of his fiancée. Paradoxically, this unintended consequence served to maintain the case's visibility in the public sphere. Although Tom Jacks didn't uncover substantial evidence, given the cold state of the case upon his involvement, his vigorous investigation and the comprehensive report he submitted to Scotland Yard guaranteed that affirmative measures would be taken. In February 1950, Fred Narborough, who had retired but remained steadfastly convinced, much like Jacks, that Spillman was the murderer, saw a new development. After all the publicity, Scotland Yard decided to assign another seasoned detective from the murder squad, Superintendent Reginald Spooner, to take another look at the case. Superintendent Spooner had at his disposal the reports from Chief Inspector Narborough, the findings from pathologist Keith Simpson, and the comprehensive report submitted by Jackson to Scotland Yard. The first thing Superintendent Spooner was to turn his attention to the three statements made by Spillman to Narborough, recognising the significant inconsistencies within them. With the goal of clarifying these inconsistencies, Spooner reached out to Spillman for an interview. 
Once he completed the interviews, Spooner wanted to look closer at Joan and her life. He understood that it is the victim's history and circumstances that will normally resolve the confusion. The detective returned to the beginning and studied Joan through her diaries, talking with her close friends and more. Spooner's investigation unveiled a reticent and introverted woman, devoid of any ominous past or concealed mysteries. Profoundly devout, she was an active member of an Anglo-Catholic group known as the Company of the Sacred Mission. Her faith wasn't just a facet of her existence, it was its very core. Her spirituality stood as the paramount essence of her being. In the final years leading up to her demise, she meticulously crafted a personal code by which she endeavoured to live. This code of life meticulously delineated a disciplined routine that incorporated prayer, contemplative retreats, and internal self-mortification. A significant portion, a fifth to be precise, of her income was pledged to be offered as alms to support her chosen religious organisation. In recent times it appeared that Joan, a woman once deeply rooted in her faith, was showing signs of doubt. This wavering belief, akin to a profound loss for someone so devout, was causing her great distress. Chief Inspector Spooner was certain that the final weeks of Joan's life were filled with despair, so deep that she couldn't bring herself to document the turmoil she was undergoing in her diary for the last fortnight. Perhaps it was the end of her relationship with her boyfriend, a fallout due to their irreconcilable religious differences, that had shaken her faith to its core. This loss of belief may have spiralled her into a state of depression. Spooner surmised that this could have led her to contemplate the unthinkable, suicide. A single tablet of luminal was found in her handbag. But why just one? Where were the others? Had she consumed them with a swig of lembar? These were the questions that troubled Spooner. Spooner dismissed the Home Office pathologist Dr. Simpson's claim that Joan had been violated. In his view, the advanced state of decomposition of Joan's body made it impossible to definitively determine whether any sexual activity had occurred. He questioned the absence of bruises on her arms, a common sign of struggle in assault victims who are forcibly restrained by their assailants. There was no evidence of a violent struggle. He also pointed out the button on her camisole underwear, which remained intact. If she had indeed been assaulted, wouldn't the button have likely been ripped off in the process? These were the doubts that clouded Spooner's mind. Despite the reports from Narbro and Simpson, Spooner arrived at the grim conclusion that Joan Woodhouse had taken her own life. He surmised that on her journey to King's Cross on the 31st of July, she had a change of heart. Perhaps a sudden wave of desolation had washed over her, a feeling of being utterly consumed by a burden too heavy to bear at that moment. Somewhere en route to the underground, she made her dreadful decision. She would head south to a place filled with cherished childhood memories, a place where she had spent so many happy summers with an aunt. By the time she reached Victoria, her mind was made up. She was going to end it all. And so, she purchased a one-way ticket. Perhaps she had been planning this for some time, waiting for the opportunity of the long bank holiday weekend so as not to be found and saved. As she wandered into the woods, her mind in a daze, her legs scratched and stockings torn, None of it seemed to matter anymore. That's where her journey ended. The fact that she hadn't made any sleeping arrangements for the night at any of the places she'd visited was a clear indication that she had no plans of staying. This was the line of thought Superintendent Spooner followed when, after six weeks, he presented his report to the Director of Public Prosecutions. The Director publicly announced that nothing from this second investigation warranted further action. It seemed that now that Twith Spooner's conclusions that unless something turned up, some new and unimagined piece of evidence, or a simple confession from the murderer suddenly suffering remorse, the case will be closed and the files will be shut away forever. Joan's father, possessing the same tenacity as her two aunts, refused to let the matter lie. In August, he sought a private warrant against Spillman from the Arundel magistrates, a move that hadn't been made since 1865. This meant as a private citizen, he could demand the Director of Public Prosecutions should try a person for murder, if he could get a magistrate to agree. Joan's father had the sympathy of a nation, and the warrant was issued, leading to Spillman's arrest and subsequent detention in Brixton Jail. On September 19, 1950, amidst intense media scrutiny, Spillman was brought before the magistrates. Mr. J. Bass, representing the Director of Public Prosecutions, cautioned the court at the outset of the prosecution's case, 
that their evidence was entirely circumstantial. There wasn't a shred of direct evidence implicating Spillman. While it was true that Spillman had had the opportunity to commit the crime, this alone was not enough to warrant a trial. The DPP's initial hesitation to pursue this case was palpable from the start. Bass made a case outlining again all the circumstantial evidence again and questioning Spillman regarding the changes to his statement. The crux of the prosecution's case hinged on any witnesses who could attest to seeing Spillman and Joan Woodhouse together on July 31st. However, the only witnesses who made such a claim were far from convincing. Their testimonies crumbled under the scrutiny of Jackson, who was defending Spillman. He proved that their sole intention was to claim the £500 reward and had actually never seen Joan or Spillman at any time. Jackson went on to make a superb summing up, questioning every point the prosecution had made. Finally, he pointed out that a pubic hair had been found on Joan's bra. Forensic tests had proved they were not hers. Surely they must be from her murderer, Jackson suggested, but the same forensic tests proved that they were not Spillman's either. Following a four-day hearing, the panel of five magistrates unanimously concluded that the evidence against Spillman was insufficient to warrant a trial, so that from every point of view was that. Of course, the Woodhouse family were not satisfied with the result, and claimed the prosecution was half-hearted and without conviction, and applied to Mr Justice Humphreys Lewis Assize Court for a bill of indictment. It was not given. There was a final attempt to clear up the mystery of Joan's death. A third police officer reviewed the evidence again in 1956. His name was kept secret so he would not be approached by interested parties. He arrived at the same conclusions as Detective Superintendent Spooner. It was definitely suicide but of course due to its unsatisfactory outcome. It is intriguing to wonder. Was it really suicide? What do you think? I would love to hear your thoughts. Please do comment below. I believe that Spillman may well have found the body earlier and perhaps interfered with it, but I do not believe he murdered her. It would account for his ever-changing story. The pubic hair shows that someone else certainly did interfere with the body. Perhaps they were the murderer. We will never know for sure. An investigation today would involve DNA, of course, and Spillman would not have been put through a trial. It certainly did impact on his life, and I have slightly changed his name for the sake of his family. Research will give it to you if you wish. We should always remember the name of the victim in every murder mystery. I do hope you have enjoyed my telling of this story, and please do press the like button as this encourages me to make more videos like this. Subscribe if you wish to know when I put out new true crime murder story. I look forward to seeing you next time and thank you for watching.